Good morning from Australia. I'm, I'm going to start by um, giving you a quote from the British Prime Minister Howard Macmillan in 1961. He said of one of his political opponents, the Liberal Party, at the next general elections, the Liberals will present a combination of sound and original ideas. Unfortunately, none of the sound ideas will be original and none of the original ideas will be sound. Now, in this presentation, I'm confident that all my ideas are sound because none of them are going to be original. Now, who is this presentation aimed at? It's really aimed at academics who are thinking about introducing projects into their subjects, modeling projects, and perhaps not quite sure where, you know, where do we get ideas from projects. For those of you who are more experienced and already use projects, um, hopefully one or two of the particular projects I'm going to mention will be interesting for you. So I want to talk a little bit about the types of projects that are offered in my department. So some students are able to take a project that counts as an elective, so it counts towards the graduation requirements. And we restrict these kinds of students. Um, students taking these projects are restricted to students enrolled on a, let's not worry what Bachelor of Mathematics Advanced mean, but these students take a project in the second year and they take a project in the third year. Or most degrees are offered in Wollongong come in two flavours. There's a, a normal version of the degree and then there's a Dean Scholar and the Dean Scholar students take a project in the third year of their degree. Now students can also do projects over the summer and um, it's the end of summer session in Australia. Uh, these projects don't count towards graduation requirements. And to do these projects, students need to get uh, competitive, or they need to get funding, and they can get funding from the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, so that's competitive funding across the whole of Australia, or they can get funding from my faculty. Uh, if students get the ANSI funding, which is only for six weeks, then the faculty will toby turp, so they do a 10 week project. Now, um, the Dean Scholar students have a guarantee that if they want to do a summer project that they will definitely get funding for it. So Dean Scholar students can do two projects, one that counts towards the degree requirements and one that doesn't. In the abstract, I mentioned two of the kinds of projects that we offer, and I'm not going to talk about those today. All right, so a little bit about the kind of projects that um, are being offered. So. Um, we're offering individual projects. So one student is going to work as one academic over the course of a session. And this project is going to be a quarter of a full time load because it's replacing a normal subject. Now, we're only offering these projects to our top students. So that makes a big difference in the kind of projects um, that we're offering. You know, we're not having to find projects for all the students taking a particular subject. So what kind of projects do we offer? Um, you know, we can't cover everything in an undergraduate curriculum, we're quite a small department. So some projects might be, here's an interesting area of mathematics that we don't teach and a student can investigate that. Or sometimes projects are extensions of material that's covered in the undergraduate curriculum. So students can um, extend their knowledge in an area. Now, there's no expectations that students, the original research as part of these projects, and a lot of these projects are probably best considered as being reading subjects or um, directed reading subjects. Now, most of the projects I offer are in modeling, but maybe I'm a fraud giving a talk at this conference. Maybe this is a fraudulent talk because um, I don't offer a project, this is an interesting area, let's develop a model for this problem, let's try and understand the model, um, let's get some insight into the problem. Instead, I'm offering projects, this is an interesting problem, let's use an, an existing model to look at this problem, let's understand the model, and then what are the consequences for the problem. So these aren't projects where students develop the models from scratch. So yeah, so you might think that this is fraudulent. Now, most of this presentation, I want to talk upon, you know, where do I get the ideas for the projects that I offer? And one um, source of projects is from listening to research talks. Now, obviously most research talks aren't suitable for undergraduate projects, um, but occasionally they are. 
And I want to take a few minutes to talk about a particular talk that I heard in December last year uh, by Matthew. He's at the University of Queensland, and he was talking about the dynamics of illegal harvest. And I think that his um, his talk has got a lot of really good ideas for student projects in it. So he's interested in poaching. And I don't mean the poaching of an egg, although that would be an interesting heat transfer problem to give a student. We're talking about poaching of animals such as elephants or tigers. So how can mathematics be used to investigate poaching? So I need a model um, for how the animal that's being poached is responding to the poaching. And a natural framework to use is a predator-prey model. The predators are going to be the poachers and the prey is the species um, that's being poached. Normally when we have a predator-prey equation, at least at the undergraduate level, if we look at the predator equation, there's normally two terms on the right hand side of that differential equation. One term is the per capita growth rate of the predators and the second term is like a decay rate of the predators. So in this poaching context, the, the, right, the first term on the right hand side, the amount of poaching that's happening, this needs to be a function of the quantity of the product that's on the market and how the market price is changing as more or less products available. And the second term on the right hand side is going to be a function that's like the fixed costs of poaching. So you've got a simple dynamical systems model. And on top of this, you can then build an optimization or an optimal control problem um, if you want to reduce the amount of poaching. You don't need to go to that, though, because just looking at the models, finding the steady states, doing the stability analysis, looking at phase planes, how these things change as you change a parameter, that can give you a lot of um, useful information. And this is where it leads into undergraduate projects, because a lot of these models contain two state variables so we can use a lot of techniques that we teach undergraduates so the kind of question that Matthew wants to answer is you know is it better to legalize trade because that might reduce the demand the illegal demand for, po for poaching or is it better to put money into um, enforcement to try and reduce poaching that way so I really like this talk because it's simple models, simple um, ways of analyzing models. Um, I think they're very suitable for undergraduate projects. And it's an important problem. And it's not like a modeling paper where, you know, here's a model and here's some analysis and here are some vague conclusions. Uh, Matthew's actually gone to give presentations to policymakers um, and his research is having an effect on the kind of policies that are now being introduced um, to restrict poaching. So these are models which have got really um, important real world applications. And just to conclude, uh, these models suggest that demand reduction is a better strategy than just increasing law enforcement. So I've talked about this for a few minutes because I think I'm guessing that for most of you, you haven't come across this research before. I haven't come across it until I heard his talk. And I think it's a really interesting area with a lot of scope for undergraduate projects. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a research project if you're um, using Matthew's models, but I think there is scope here for undergraduates to develop their own models. Now, if I had a math student who was doing a major in economics, maybe they want to revisit the way that the profit function is being modeled. And um, I added this into my talk a minute or two ago. Perhaps Glenn's talk wasn't a research talk, but it was a really great talk. And it had lots of ideas for student projects. Um, and his code's available. If you didn't go to his talk, you can watch his presentation in a few weeks' time, or you can go to his web page and download, download the resources. All right. Mass exposition articles are a good idea for projects. So in Cyan Review last year, there was an article about how do you set up a new subject where you're going to use mathematics to model cancer, but you want the subject to be of interest to math majors and science majors. I don't have the luxury of being able to introduce a new subject, but I can pillage this article and get a large number of projects out of it because it's you know, they've identified the key topics that you might want to cover in a cancer search, cancer paper, cancer subject. They've identified the 
research papers that you can use to build your course materials. They've identified typical kinds of assignment questions. Um, it's really made for people who want to do projects in cancer to take ideas from this article. I would also mention that um, in May last year, Siam News had an, a whole issue which was on infectious disease modeling. Some of the articles in this um, special issue aren't appropriate for undergraduate projects, but some of them are very um, good and can be easily adopted and offered. Um, I'm using Siam News um, for a lot of my examples because if you're not a member of Siam, Siam News is um, it's like a newspaper that's keeping you up to date on applied mass research and the articles aren't research articles. They're providing an easily understood digest of research articles um, and they can, quite often there's really good ideas in Siam News that you can adapt and use for projects. Now research articles, again, it's like a research talk. Not many research articles are going to be appropriate for undergraduate projects, but some of them are. So just to mention two projects that I'm running in autumn session that's starting on March the 1st. Um, this is a paper that's looking at SI models and SIS models and um, SIR models and including vaccination. And maybe vaccination is not perfect because you're going to lose your immunity. And it's using simple models, simple tools to investigate how much of the population you need to vaccinate to get herd immunity. And a second um, project that I'm running starting in March is uh, based upon a paper where we're looking at a drug epidemic sweeping through a population and what are the role of the drug barons in controlling um, how the epidemic is sweeping through the population. Now, a good source of ideas for projects that offer your students are projects that have been offered to other students. And this was a, um, a paper that reviewed projects that have been carried out by students working at the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute. And it has a lot of, there are a lot of really good ideas in here that you can take and offer as projects um, yourself. And um, I have used um, a few of the ideas that were mentioned in this article. So the drug barren project I'm doing this session comes from something that was mentioned in this paper. And I've also had projects looking at the spread of alcoholism through a population or the spread of smoking through a population. Um, and those ideas are coming from this article. If you do a Google search on this, um, or if you get a copy of my presentation, you can just click on, click on the link and it will take you through a list of about the 50 projects that I've supervised over the last 15 years or so. And then you can see the titles and you can see the abstracts. And if you wanted more information, you could contact me. All right, just some miscellaneous ideas for projects. Um, I often find that when I examine a PhD, the early chapters of the PhD, I've got good ideas for projects. Now there's a bit of an etiquette involved here, depending upon if the PhD student was reviewing the literature or developing their own models. Um, but I've often found good ideas in PhD CCs. And finally, perhaps your own research um, is it's natural to spin ideas off from your research that can be used for undergraduate projects. Now I'm running out of time, so I um, I think I'll go quickly through this, but I just want to reinforce that my institution, we're only offering these projects to our top students. And this is obviously coloring the kind of projects that we offer to them. And I'll skip the, how do we assess student projects? I, I do want to mention this. So a lot of my projects are based upon research papers and do I want to share the paper with the student? And quite often the answer is no, because if I want the student to repeat calculations from the paper, I want to be sure that the students actually done them themselves. So I don't share the paper. On the other hand, if the project's more numerical and there's a few differential equations and a lot of parameter values, then I'll share the paper with the student from the beginning. Now, as time's running out, I just want to go to this question you note. Know, should students do research as part of their project? Now, I've already mentioned that it's not required at my institution, but what do we mean by research? 
Now, as academics, we might think that research is something that leads to papers. Uh, perhaps this is a narrow um, interpretation as to what we mean by research. So a student might have a paper and they might be able to make minor changes to the model or they might be able to do new numerical investigations that aren't in the original model and they're not significant enough to do to get a paper from it, but it's still new research um, and the students should realize that they're doing research. Or maybe um, a student can make more major modifications um, and it could lead to a paper. And that's happened a few times um, for projects I've run. And the main problem is that the students leave and they don't write up the papers and you have to find the time to write it yourself. So to conclude, perhaps I'm looking at my institution because we only offer projects to our best students. I've gone through some mechanisms for where you get ideas for projects from. I didn't talk about how we assess the students. There wasn't time for that. Um, should students do research, um, I think we should have a more broad interpretation as to what we mean by research. Research doesn't have to lead to a publication. Students can do new things, um, which is research. Um, this is the exact quote that I paraphrased at the beginning. And it's time to return to the conclusions and then ask any questions. Let's thank Mark for a wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, any questions for Mark? Okay, I see something in chat. Okay, it's not a math question. Yes, it's not a math question. Um, I am in Australia where it is currently 9.47 a.m. in the morning. And I'm very grateful for Brian for scheduling my presentation. Um, in this evening session and not in tomorrow's session which starts at 2 a.m my time and um, i wouldn't like to give a presentation then um, our spring session starts on the first of march um, and it's about time to gird my loins and to um, get ready for the start of teaching okay i also saw another chat another comment on the chat uh from glenn letter Professional threat research as a noun at undergraduate level research as a verb. <laughs> yes, that's good. I'll have to remember that. That was a good one. All right. Any other questions for Mark? So I have a quick question, Mark. Suppose when you are doing this mentoring with undergraduates, are you giving research papers as a starting point or are you giving lectures first and then the research papers? So it would depend a bit upon the nature of the project. So for this project I'm doing, which is looking at the infections and um, let me just go back. Yeah, for this project that's using this paper from the Journal of Theoretical Biology, I won't give that paper to the student. What I'll do is, I'll give them a model and I'll give them some questions that I want them to answer. And luckily for me, um, this student's done a second year subject that includes an introduction to mathematical epidemiology. So they're always, they've got a little bit of background already. During the course of the project, I might have to teach the student new skills. Um, and I might share the paper with them towards the end of the project. On this second project that's using this paper, this model is more complicated and I'll probably start by giving this, this student this paper to begin with and say, you know, we're going to work our way through this paper. And during the course of the session, I'll need to teach that student new skills um, so that they, she can work through some of the sections in this paper. So yes, it depends a bit upon the paper. Great. So also the follow-up is like, is it a one semester project or, or are you doing with a couple? Yeah. Yeah, so these undergraduate projects for second year and third year students, they run for one semester and it's one quarter of a full time load because it's replacing a normal subject that they would do. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Mark? Yeah, I see a comment from Anne. Chat. Yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah, I think this is the direction that I'd like to go into in the future to have more projects where students find data and data driven modeling. And I'm very excited to see that there's a few talks along that line in this workshop. 
Although, unfortunately, they were timetabled a bit early in the morning. So I might be watching those videos when they go up in a few weeks' time. That's oh, cool. Early in the morning for me, not for you. <laughs>